When I was 15 and playing D&D for the first time, there were two things motivating me to get behind the screen. First, I really, really wanted to see the secrets in the adventure. This is that adventure, Castle Amber, my first experience with D&D and still one of the weirdest adventures I've encountered. My DM bought this adventure and picked a location in his world to drop it into. He had a huge world map, an entire planet basically that took up one whole wall of his room. Anytime he was bored or inspired, he'd add to it. When I saw that map, I had stars in my eyes. I wanted to make a world. Making your own fantasy world is one of the unique joys of being a dungeon master, and it's fun because the trick is you don't need that massive map of a whole planet on your wall with continents and oceans. That's not how my friend started. He started the same way I started, the same way you can start. He started with a local area. All you need is a local area and you are ready to start playing. We're talking about an area maybe 300 miles across, two weeks travel maybe less. You'll be able to run D&D there for months. I've run tons of games, all starting at first level and finishing round sixth in the same region. And for those players, that local area was Matt's world. Because I want to encourage you to build your own world, starting with your own local area, I've made a handout you can download. There is a link in the doobly-doo. It's a form-fillable PDF. All you have to do is answer a series of questions. When you're done, you will have a local area, and for your players, that will be your world. The questions are simple, but the answers may be hard because you have to invent some stuff, names and people, and you need some ideas, as you'll see. In a sense, especially if you use this sheet. All local areas are similar, but your answers will make your world unique. What we're doing is we're building the kind of place that your typical medieval European peasant from say the 12th century would be familiar with. When we're done, we won't have a map, though you are free to draw one, because peasants would have had no need of a map back then. They knew what was around and about how far away things were and how to get to anywhere important. Most peasants spent years without going more than a few towns away from their home. And look, I I'm not an artist or a cartographer. Odds are you aren't either. So any map we might make would be crude, but you will be thinking visually. You won't be able to help yourself as you build a map of the area in your head. There's a town, a starting town. The town is probably near a river. Most medieval towns were, and there's probably a road leading to it. The town has an inn. What's it called? Who do we meet when we go inside? A local area is bounded. It's a map with stuff at the edges that define it, that give it its identity. A forest over here, some hills over here. Maybe the whole thing is bounded by forest. There are a couple of nearby villages. What are their names? There's a distant city, probably not on this map, but if you just follow the road, what's that city's name? Also, someone's probably in charge. There's probably a local noble who considers this place part of their realm. What is that person's name? But the town basically runs itself. There's a town council, probably made of the town's elders, who act as a practical but informal government. They make the decisions and they probably do it in the open and everyone knows who they are. So who are they? The people who live in this area are part of a culture and they have opinions about folk, like what do the locals think about elves? Maybe they're a rare treat like in the Fellowship of the Ring or maybe they're dangerous or mysterious or common, just plain folk. And remember, this is what the locals think about the elves. Doesn't mean it's true. What about dwarves or halflings or humans? Maybe the locals are the elves or the dwarves. There are other ancestries in D&D, but the core rules don't assume every campaign has those. You can sort of see how you could just add questions to your own version of this sheet. But the answers to questions like, what do the folk think about the elves, will have a big impact on who your players decide to play. You can see already we're developing a lot of content for your world. Another important element in an area's culture is religion. The player's handbook says when you create a cleric, the most important question to ask is which deity you serve, and then it lists six domains. So we need the names of six gods, one for each domain. Write down anything about that god that springs to mind, but don't feel like you have to invent six entire religions. Religions have holy days and rituals and iconography, but like the rest of your world, you can spend your entire life developing that stuff. If you have a cool idea about this god or that god, write it down. Don't think, oh, but then I have to do all the symbols and rituals for all the gods. No, 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 not to get started playing. Write down whatever cool ideas you got now, 
finish the rest when it becomes relevant. If a player wants to serve the god of knowledge, well, that's a good reason to flesh that god out. You'll flesh out all the gods later. Your local area has some famous NPCs, people everyone knows who don't necessarily live in your starting town, but they're good people to talk to when the players are trying to unravel a mystery. Even if they don't know very much, someone around here is the local expert on the arcane, on spells and magic and artifacts and lore. It might be a third level wizard like Pinna in Gravesford, or it might be a powerful seventh level enchanter with their own tower. Up to you. Likewise, someone is the local expert on religion, on the gods and undead and religious lore and artifacts, and someone, probably a very old person, is the local expert on history, not gods and spells, but what happened here long ago. And someone, maybe a ranger or just a woodsman or a traveling minstrel, is the local expert on the area's geography. We heard a rumor about an abandoned mine, but we don't know where it is. Let's ask... Of course, we need adventure, and for that we need some enemies. Our local area is suitable for low-level play, so we need a tribe of nearby low-level monsters. Which monsters? And what are they called? Also, we need something to aspire to. Someone we know about, but we're not ready to fight yet. A slightly farther off, mid-level monster tribe. We'll deal with those guys later when we level up a few times. Of course, our adventure needs a villain, and they must be around here someplace. Who is your local evil boss? What do they want? What are they trying to do? What is their evil scheme? And what will happen if they get it? At this point, we know a lot about our world. We certainly know enough to start prepping a simple adventure. And you probably already have lots of ideas for other details. That means the system works. Everything we've talked about so far is deliberately stuff anyone from this area, anyone who lived here, would know. High-level details, cultural stuff. But a good campaign setting needs secrets. This may be the most fun stuff, but also maybe the hardest. The answers to these questions are a big part of what makes your world unique. What does everyone in your world know that's different from the generic fantasy world? What do very few people know? What does no one in your world know yet? What secret knowledge has been forgotten or hidden? Maybe it's... The reason humans have so many gods. Maybe it's why there are no druids. I just made that up, but it's cool. I want to know why there are no druids. Maybe it's why there used to be four moons and now there's only three. These last two questions, maybe you print a copy of the sheet for your players that has those fields blank. They are, after all, mysteries, but they can drive the engine of drama that will be your campaign world. There are mysteries in my world that no player has even wondered about for 20 years. That's it. One page. Answer these questions and your world is ready to play in. A local area, maybe a couple hundred miles across. A place to stay, some bad guys to fight. You are ready. The first time you sit down to fill this out, you will discover that some of these questions you don't have answers to. And maybe you're not really interested in the answer. You'll think, man, I don't know. That means you're not inspired. You're not inspired to figure out what the name of this local forest is, or the local hills, or the local noble lord. That's fine. Skip that question. Come back to it later. But here's another trick. If you're not inspired to come up with a name, come up with something cool about it. I don't know what this forest is called, but I know there are manticores living there. Not just one, like a lot of them. That's cool. It's interesting. It's unique. It gives the forest flavor, personality, drama. And now you can start thinking about what would the locals call a forest that's had a bunch of manticores in it for as long as anyone can remember. You know, you can be very literal and call it the manticore forest. Okay, that's not a dumb name. I think especially when we're young, direct and literal names like that are cool. They're evocative. And that actually is how people tend to name things in the real world. But then, over many generations, the terms change. I'd probably call it the barbed forest for the barbed stinger on a manticore's tail. But I'd call it that because I was imagining a common person's term for a manticore, like a barbed lion. Manticore is the sage's name for them, the scientific name. So it was once the barbed lion forest. But over time, they dropped the middle term. Just one idea the local forest, and already it's interesting and has some history and character. Don't feel like you have to answer every question in one go. Focus on the stuff the locals would know. You want enough details so your players aren't lost. Like, you probably need to know who runs the local inn, who cooks the meals, who serves the drinks, but you don't need to know the name of every person in the common room. There are a million ways to run D&D. Your game may not have a local area, or your game might be set somewhere, or some when, when these assumptions don't make any sense. That's not a problem, it's cool. A game set amongst desert nomads with no roads and no rivers and maybe no towns would be very different, but it would be super cool. With no more information than this, I ran a great campaign for my friends where they all started out as kids. The oldest was maybe 18, the youngest 12. When a carrion crawler erupted out from the caves no one knew were under the baker's house, they didn't wait for adventurers to show up, they became the adventurers the town needed. They saved themselves. 
And my players loved it. Don't be afraid that answering these questions will produce a local area that's really similar to someone else's. Your players can't play in everyone else's game. Who cares if your world is really similar to people running D&D in another state? And really, I don't think you can answer these questions without making a unique world that you know literally better than anyone else. So download the PDF and start imagining. In three years, someone might see a map of your world and get stars in their eyes. But all you need to build a world now is to answer a few questions. That's it, folks. That's the local area video. This video is the first one we've produced with the help of our new art director, my friend Jason Hasenauer. I really wanted this video to have a form fillable PDF you could download and answer these questions. And I just wanted it to look nice. Not crazy illustrated full color layout like our books, more like an old school character sheet. And thanks to Jason, we can do that. He drew everything by hand, by the way, all those little icons, the crossed swords, the drama masks. He drew the little fiddly bits around the border. It's a small thing. He's mostly working on art for the next Kickstarter, but it is a big deal to us. We didn't brand the sheet. It doesn't say MCDM anywhere on it. It's free. We want people to share it. We want people to use it. We don't care if they know who made it or where it came from. And that's the way I will know this video has been successful is if I see people using the sheet, it would be just huge for me to see like years from now, people are still using this sheet to start building their own world. You may have noticed I'm wearing a really cool shirt. I'm really proud of our friend Tom Schmuck who plays Boots designed this logo. It's the logo you see at the start of the stream on Wednesday nights. And you can now go to our store. There's a link in the doobly-doo and pre-order this shirt. We intend on doing a different shirt every year. So this is the 2019 shirt. We don't run ads on these videos as I think you folks know. We do have a Patreon. There's a link to that. You can come by and I post my notes on the upcoming session on Patreon for a $5 here, supporters and above. And we also play D&D on Wednesday nights. You can come by our Twitch stream. There's a link to that in the doobly-doo. And I think this next session is going to be pretty crazy. And of course, if you want to support the channel, you can always pick up Strongholds and Followers, which is shipping now. People have gotten their books. There are some people out there for whom the Kickstarter is over. Uh, the, we, we've completed our obligation to them. This process, they're shipping like 1,500 orders a day. This process is going to continue for another several weeks. People, uh, you know, on in other parts of the world. It's probably gonna take a little while for them to get their books, but it's happening. It's real. We are on the cusp of completing this Kickstarter, which means I don't know what the next video is going to be, but we're going to start doing a series of postmortem videos on how the Kickstarter went. And we've actually worked quite hard on those postmortem videos, taken a lot of notes and, you know, made a lot of observations about things we learned and things we do differently. That's it, folks. If you're a new dungeon master just getting started, I hope this inspires you to make a new world that can be fun and easy and relatively straightforward. And you don't have to be an artist. That was the point of the sheet is it's just a bunch of questions you answer. And if you get to the end and answer all those questions, you've made a world. Until next time, peace out.